Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, I'm Lisa. I'm here today with my guest, Venkat. Hey, Lisa. I'm Venkat, and this is Scorpio Season, and I'm here with my guest, Lisa. Um, Venkat, do you have a snack that you're eating today? So today I didn't get very creative, so I just have lemonade that I made myself. Oh, that's cool. What did you have? Um, <laughs> I, uh, I I did some scrounging around in the fridge at the last moment, and I found some locks that I made last week. I'm not sure if it's still good. What's lock? Locks, L O X. It's um, it's like brine salmon. Oh, okay. So like I'm vegetarian, so I don't know these things. All right, so lemonade and locks. Oh, speaking of locks, I'm surprised you didn't notice my hair, which is actually a good thing. <laughs> I gave, um, this is, I gave myself part two of the haircut. My wife did the back and sides because I couldn't reach, but the top is all me. And the fact that uh, it's not atrocious enough that you noticed says a lot that the haircut is actually decent. It looks very decent, Venkat. You should be proud of yourself. Yeah, I am. I was posting selfies. I very rarely do that, but this motivated me to post selfies on Twitter as well as on my family WhatsApp group. But my family okay. didn't seem too impressed, but oh well. All right, so what are we talking about today? The letter L, right? It's letter L, yeah. So we have four things on the list today as a change of pace from last week where we talked through everything. Yep. Um, we had like 20. All right, so topic number one, legibility. So this, I'm going to put myself up there as an expert since I helped popularize the concept quite a bit. What about you? Um, I don't think I'm as an expert as you are in legibility. Um, Middle? Yeah, that's generous, but okay, yeah. All right, if it's generous, I'll move you back a little bit. <laughs> okay. All right, legal systems. Okay. Mm. I'm very a, mediocre, yeah. I have a lot of opinions about legal systems, but I don't... Have you had run-ins with it? I'd say my level of interactions with the actual legal system are quite small, though. So no in-person legal experience. Okay, so I think both of us should very humbly put ourselves in the lower left quadrant. Right, They're both so quite arrogant. We rarely go into this quadrant. Third quadrant, yeah, that's true. All right, LARPing. Do you go to actual been, LARPs? No, I've never been to a LARP. Um, that's live action role play, right? Yep. Uh, no, I've never LARPed anything at a LARP. So I use it as a, a metaphor a lot for the way people behave, but a literal LARP, yeah, me neither. I've never been. Uh, but, but I do sort of think about it and use the term a lot to like think about how people behave. So I'm going to give myself a little bit uh, more. Uh, but what about you? Do you use the term in your thinking a lot, like besides the literal? I mean, yeah, sometimes. Um, yeah, okay. I think I think where it is right now is a good place, like just above the line. Yeah. Let's do that. All right, log level. So since this is a concept I made up for myself, <laughs> but basically things at the level of like computer logs or any, any process logging events and so forth. And as a Bitcoin programmer, I think you should give yourself a high log level understandings. I'm a very, yeah, I've actually spent some time working on log systems before. So I'm a fairly expert at logs. So I'll actually give you expert and I'll be a little short of expert since I'm kind of an armchair spectator theorist of logs. And uh, <laughs> I've written a few, like back in my grad school days, I uh, wrote a few programs that involved um, like uh, recording logs of events happening. Uh, but that's too far of back and I wouldn't want to claim too much credit for that. Okay, so that's our view of uh, what we're going to talk about. All right. Great. Here we go. So where should we start? Um, well, let's start. Maybe we should start with legibility. All right, legibility. So uh, I assume we are both thinking of the same concept, James Scott seeing like a state version of legibility. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe not. Yes. I think, yeah, I think that, I think that James Scott's thing like a state definitely is what I would want to say like kind of solidified what 
made legibility a legible concept to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of like pointing out kind of system, how legibility tends to be a feature of most systems. Like every system incorporates some level of legibility, like that is what makes it a system. Um, but do you want to talk maybe more about how James C. Scott plays that out? Yeah, so this is kind of interesting because I think it's one of my top blog posts in terms of like um, traffic and getting passed around. And it's uh, the only one that's a book review. Like it's uh, literally just a summary of the ideas and um, quick like TLDR of the book. And um, I think I wrote it in 2011 and it's in probably in my top three or four blog posts in terms of the number of new readers it's gotten me. So, uh, and the, it sort of became an organizing concept for everything I have written as well as like others have written on Ribbon Farm. So it's kind of become one of those lighthouse concepts we use to organize uh, everything we think about. So for those who are not familiar, um, legibility is a notion that uh, James Scott um, introduced and used a lot in his book, Seeing Like a State. And the basic idea is that if you're something like a central planner and you look at a complex, uh, especially social reality, like say a city or a forest, and you look at it from the perspective of uh, uh, what you want to do with it. So for example, if you're a government uh, forestry officer, you want to like maximize yield of timber from the forest. So you tend to look at it from that very narrow perspective of this forest is basically a natural resource for uh, lumber. And you kind of, um, everything else about the forest stops making sense to you. So it comes across to you as noise and that's illegibility. And you imagine that it's like uh, meaningless chaos and it doesn't mean anything simply because you're not interested in it. So in that sense, the illegibility is sort of a false sense of um, chaos and uh, incomprehensibility. Whereas really what's happening is because your focus is so narrow on like one aspect of the system, everything else you're not able to parse it. And typically if you have a lot of power, um, like government agencies typically have, that's why it's called seeing like a state, you will do things that destroy the things that you don't understand. So uh, that's the concept of legibility and illegibility. And James Scott's version of it is, Seeing like a state means looking at what you understand, sort of um, dismissing what you don't understand, and then forcing the system to fit into your legible understanding of it. So an example of that, again, uh, scientific forestry is what he uses, which is uh, if you're only interested in the timber or lumber yield of a forest, you will look at all the other kinds of trees and animals and shrubs as useless. You might sort of um, uh, encourage cutting down of all the other aspects of the forest. And then you end up with all these monocultural stands of like the same kind of tree because you want the highest yielding variety of trees. So you make sure all the trees are there and they're planted in neat rows. And one of the effects is uh, you end up with um, monoculture uh, fragility. So if there's a pest or an insect or something that damages your one variety of tree, it can take down the whole forest. So that's kind of the, in a nutshell, uh, what, um, James Scott's means by legibility and illegibility. And a related thing that he does not talk about in his book, but a lot of people use as their uh, short understanding of what legibility is, is the uh, parable of Chesterton's fence. So uh, uh, are you familiar with Chesterton's fence? Oh, so this, uh, you've probably heard of it, but maybe not the name, uh, but it's uh, the parable goes that there are two people walking in a field and there's a fence across it. And one of them is a visionary urban planner type person and says, uh, I don't see the point of this fence. I'm gonna get it torn down and I'm gonna like build like a city or build it here. And the other guy says, uh, I'm not gonna let you do that. Only if you can explain to me why the fence is there in the first place, then I might give you um, sort of uh, my go ahead to tear down the fence. So that's sort of a heuristic of, uh, if you don't understand a complex reality because it's illegible to you, then until you make an effort to understand it, you shouldn't actually try to turn it, uh, tear it down. So it has a conservative bias if you are biased towards that. It has a conservative as in like, um, not conservative as in politics, but conservative as in conserving things. So in that sense, conservative uh, bias to it. Um, so yeah, that's my short two minute explainer on legibility. So is that, kind of how you understand it as well? Yeah, I think so. Um, 
So I guess just to phrase or maybe like rephrase it, my understanding of what you've explained is that part of legibility is, so but like the other's like two sides to legibility. There's what gets noticed and what's easily like countable in this tree, like tree example. And then there's everything that because it's of its lack of legibility, it gets, um, kind of falls by the wayside and has a tendency to um, maybe get neglected or destroyed in an environment where it's not the legible object, yep. so to speak. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, I've been watching a lot of Jordan Peterson lately. Um, mm -hmm. I specifically his biblical lectures, he's got like maybe there's like 10 of them and they're each two hours long. So about like 25 hours worth of like biblical psychological, like what would you call it? Like the psychological significance of the Bible, like the early Genesis. Mm -hmm. I don't think he gets much beyond Genesis. Um, but it's in it, he talks a lot about, he talks a lot about legibility and chaos. Um, and his whole, I think, I might get this wrong, but I think that part of his conception of like what God represents is to some extent legibility um, and hierarchy because hierarchy is assigning a, a certain amount of legibility to a system, right? Like you organize the things such that you can see where they fit in a larger structure, like that's hierarchy, right? Um, which is interesting. It's interesting to see these like, um, it's interesting to see legibility applied to the religious perspective that God is like the application of, is of an ordering to a space. And so God as We've an talked entity. about a version of this, uh, I think several episodes ago, right? Because it depends on the kind of religion. If you look at uh, sort of classical Christianity, that, that's an axial age religion when like large empires were starting to form. Uh, so it sort of uh, mirrors the institutional structure of large empires with an emperor at top and like courtiers and like a large administrative apparatus. So Christianity has that sort of monotheistic, not just monotheistic structure, but um, sort of an institutional structure under it. Whereas if you look at Old Testament stuff, it's a lot more illegible. If you look at polytheistic religions like Hinduism, again, it gets even more illegible. So I think you have a sense of the conception of religion tends to mirror the society that produced it and then it becomes sort of a legibilizing lens on the society itself right so yeah. christianity in europe i think uh, a good way of understanding it is uh, sort of the house of god concept like the way it evolved from like greece and rome this is hannah arendt stuff uh, she talks about it in the human condition if you remember where it's like all right the, uh, what happened with christianity is that the Holy Roman Emperor and the holy part is kind of like um, relevant there. Uh, it's kind of like almost the representative of God. And so the empire is kind of the household of God. So it's a, it's a way to legibilize a country or an empire from the lens of a household, which is a much simpler uh, social construct, right? A household is much simpler, which is why I think uh, there's, there's actually a common argument between conservatives and liberals where conservatives like to apply household metaphors to countries of like, you know, balance the budget, deficits are bad. And then you have to argue with, no, a household budget is not the same as a country's budget because you can print money. Speaking of printing money, <laughs> <laughs> you're in Bitcoin territory again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 There's uh, another <coughs> aspect of, um, sorry, <coughs> another aspect of legibility that I wanted to um, uh, bring up because it doesn't often come up. Uh, James Scott is sort of a left anarchist by inclination. So he, his natural bias is to always declare the authoritarian high modernist perspective, which is the one that tries to make things legible through power. And they're the villains in the James Scott version of the story. And the sort of uh, good people are like, you know, for example, the villagers who might live around the forest and have a much more intimate and organic relationship with the forest. Maybe they forage for mushrooms there. They use it for not just um, firewood, but for 50 other purposes, animals, uh, you know, graze over there and stuff. So in James Scott's sort of politics, uh, the authoritarian high modernist who wants to like make the forest legible is the villain and the small community of villagers are the good guys. 
but this is in my opinion not always the case like one example i think about a lot a, a lot is uh, measurement systems so the us is still on the you know the foot pound um, uh, imperial system and even england is not on that system and all of europe and uk is on the metric system most of the world is on the metric system and uh, it was i think something that happened after napoleon so napoleon was one these are big military force who made it happen and the argument that that's an interesting one because you can make the argument both ways on the one hand if you have standard systems of measures you have a way to integrate large areas like you know continents or even the entire planet can be on the same standard the same time standard the same length standard and so forth whereas if every little village has its own time zone every little village has its own measure of like length or weight long distance trade becomes really difficult and hard so there's a clear trade off between like global sort of um, legibility and efficiency and very local sort of illegibility and local power and um, in some in some cases i agree with james scott's bias and side with the little local guys but in lots of other cases like you and i are talking on zoom which runs on tcp ip standards which is a global standards and this would basically not work if networks didn't have this common like legible language to talk to each other right so anyway that's i, I kind of want to just flag that because a lot of people who especially email me after reading my blog post they tend to be these um, uh left anarchist um, ideologues who are really excited that they've found an idea that organizes their thinking and I'm like uh there's two sides to that <laughs> i think it's funny i mean so was it two episodes ago that we were talking about starbucks and how i think it was the jane next oh yeah yeah where you were very much into the legibility that starbucks gives any new city that you go into totally in terms of being able to get coffee and you know what kind of coffee you're going to get and level of service is like you understand it right yep um so i think that's similar i think something else that's really funny to me just on the topic of legibility is that your you were saying that you know if you think if your blog is like a like there's a funnel of how people fall into reading mm -hmm. the urban farm blog community and one of these things is this um book review as you call it or maybe book summary sounds more yeah it's more of a book summary yeah so a book summary about seeing like the state and um i think it's funny that a, the blog post on legibility is the one that makes you legible to to, <laughs> to other people it's like yes i am legible because of my work on a review of legibility um and that is what makes me more legible to all like the rest of it so I don't know, maybe, maybe. No, I wouldn't say that. It, it, it's a prominent sort of lightning rod of interest, but I wouldn't say it makes the blog itself more legible. Like the blog is as illegible as ever. It's almost like it's a funnel that dumps you into a poorly organized forest, and then you you still have to wander the forest. And for some people, that's worth doing if they find a couple of other like internally linked articles they like, and then they you know work it out. Otherwise, it's not. So. It, legibility is not the same as visibility there are extremely visible things that are not very legible and there are extremely legible things that are not very visible right so it's um, they're kind of orthogonal i would say wait that's an interesting distinction there i think maybe to some extent i have them like very closely like i think in my mind it legibility and visibility are like very similar is it the the visibility doesn't necessarily like contain a structure i i mean that's the whole uh, point of the concept if you think about it like something is very visible but if you don't understand it it's illegible right like what's the difference between equally okay. visible downtown neighborhoods that are like full of clean high rises and regular blocks versus the neighboring few blocks that are full of slums and shanty town stuff right you spent time in brazil so you you're familiar with that kind of scene where there's this really well developed place where rich people live and right next to it is like uh, favelas and slums which are hard to like parse they're both equally visible but one is a lot more legible than the other like the neighborhoods might both be like you know so many square miles but one is you look at it you're like all right this is how i navigated that's the prominent landmark that's the shopping district that's the residential whereas you look over here it's this mess of like 
like uh, tarps and weird constructions. You don't know who lives where, whether it's a criminal zone or a shopping zone. And, and those things matter. Like, uh, I don't know about Brazilian slums, but in um, Indian slums, uh, they're actually thriving economic engines. There's like a small scale industry there. There's people who live there. There's like doctors who practice there. So yeah, visibility is not the same as um, legibility. Uh, so yeah, legibility is, uh, it's kind of like uh, the word choice that James Scott made there is interesting because legibility is a very sensory idea, right? Like handwriting is legible, right? Like whether or not you have a readable handwriting, that's a legibility question. But it sort of bleeds into comprehensibility and comprehensibility is sort of a mental model thing, right? Like once you read a doctor's handwriting and you sort of decipher the prescription um, they've written, in your head it becomes clear. So that's, uh, you comprehend it. So legibility I think is the sensory signature of comprehensibility and illegibility is the sensory signature of um, incomprehensibility. Right, because if you can, because you can extend the handwriting metaphor, right? Like, if it's illegible, you can't even read the words. If you can't read the words, there's no hope that you have of comprehension. Um, but just because you can read the words doesn't mean that you'll have the ability to comprehend it. It just means that you'll have a starting point, sort of. To yeah. yeah, and there can be levels to that, right? Like the actual lettering may be legible to you and you sort of can read the literal words, but maybe you're not familiar with the actual words. So you have to look up the dictionary. So that's a second level, level of legibility. And maybe you're not used to that idiomatic usage. And so that's a third level of illegibility of, you don't know the subculture from which that particular passage has come. So you kind of misread it, right? Uh, so there's like layers and layers in um, legibility and illegibility. And, and it's, this, this relates to what we were talking about, I think, under L, literacy, because literacy is the ability to make things legible to yourself. Like the same exact scene, it could be legible to you and not to me. Like um, the example I'm thinking of is a friend of mine, he's a martial artist, and um, for a long time he was trying to get me interested. I'm not, even though, like I said last time, I have a yellow belt in karate. Uh, but uh, he shared this video with me and he was like, wow, look at that. That's like so much sophistication and artistry in those moves. And to me, it was like, I can't tell this apart from any random, you know, movie fight. And he's like, oh yeah, it's not legible to you because you don't understand the grammar of, uh, or the visual language of uh, fighting. And there's a really good article about this in, uh, about John Wick, which is one of my favorite uh, movies. So there was a whole article about sort of the visual syntax and grammar of the fight scenes in um, John Wick. And John Wick, uh, the movies were directed by the stunt uh, coordinator of the Matrix movies. So the guy is basically a stunt guy and he decided to make a movie with um, and a showcasing fighting at its core. So yeah, all sorts of legibility. It's, it's there in computers as well, like uh, uh, or in computing as well, um, like microservices and uh, polyglot per persistence are two concepts in cloud computing today that I think are basically about legibility. You, you, do, you do still do Android development? You used to, right? No, I did for a while, yeah. And a polyglot persistence is basically, if you think about it, like the computing equivalent of um, the Tower of Babel story where it's like everybody use your own language, polyglot, right? So that's an illegibility of uh, linguistic landscape. If everybody's speaking the same language, there's a certain legibility to a larger culture. Whereas if every village is speaking its own little language, that's more illegible to an outsider looking at the whole system. Yeah. Uh, I don't, yeah, so something <laughs> that I think about with legibility, looks like a pull away from the computer um, metaphor. Is I think like so I think that I think that legibility has a part sometimes in why women writers aren't as well um, aren't don't tend to be as like broadcast or like maybe and maybe this is wrong but I think that I think that to some oh, I'm curious maybe you would have it but I sometimes I find women writers more legible than male writers um, for me like an example like who are you thinking of? Like Jane Jacobs, for example, okay. like, 
reading her prose, for example, I find very easy to read and understand what she's trying to say. I've definitely talked to some other friends who are like really into urbanism and really like her ideas, but at some point confessed to me that they weren't able to read her books. They didn't find them particularly like comprehensible to them or like something about the way that she wrote. And I don't know, maybe that's not something that everyone experiences, but um, sometimes I am really con cognizant of when I'm reading a book whether it's a male or a female writer, like there's sometimes you can just like tell what that writer is taking, not for granted, but kind of like what the legible, what the ground is. Um, and sometimes I can just tell that like I don't have the same grounding. And maybe that's more of a like I'm reading an economics book. And when you read econo an economics book, they're written in like a tradition and certainly like built upon certain. Um, ways of saying things that isn't as legible if you're coming in it from it not understanding that tradition so it might not be like necessarily a gendered thing but i do sometimes wonder if there is some sort of legibility that is like slightly gendered or... okay. and so let's um, look at that so uh, to sort of analyze um thing for from a legibility lens you have to have a, a few elements right there's the thing you are looking at then there's the person who's doing the looking and then there's the model they're sort of projecting onto the thing they're looking at and what they're leaving in versus what they're leaving out right so that's those i yeah. think are the four pieces of analyzing a legibility puzzle and okay. um, like a, let's take a simpler example than jane jacobs like somebody like agatha christie right so agatha christie is a woman mystery writer and what she's looking at is i guess the complex social uh, environment of uh, uh, I guess uh, early 20th century England with its like um, society and manners and stuff. And she's imposing like the very simple formula of a murder mystery, which she deploys with great sophistication. And uh, what she leaves out is for example, like what a lot of her contemporary authors left out, which is sort of the inequities and how like um, the servants were treated in that era in England and so forth. Like in her novels, it's always fairly straightforward that the middle class people are the interesting people. The murderer is always going to be one of them. The servants are kind of like not that important and there's a clear conservative bias and so forth. But yeah, I would say uh, she, she makes, uh, what is this, Edwardian England or whatever, 1920s England, she makes it legible through the lens or perspective of a murder mystery. And I think that's, so I, I would say for that example, I agree with you where you know, male murder mystery writers tend not to be as legible. They're like a little too caught up in their own sort of, uh, uh, in their own head, like describing the Byzantine complexities of the world the detective is living in or something. Um, so actually, so maybe here's, here's a way to sort of uh, take your hypothesis, which is quite often in patriarchal societies, women are on the margins looking in. So fundamentally they're outsiders looking in as spectators from uh, who are not allowed into the core of the system. Whereas men by virtue of having power in the system, they're immersed in the middle. And it's quite natural that if you're on the outside looking in, you're able to take in the whole system and form kind of like a legible view of it. Whereas it's like forest for the trees, like literally the metaphor of being able to see the forest and not being able to see the forest for the trees. So women are able to like maybe see certain forests better and men are caught up in the trees. Does that sound like a good theory? I love that theory. I think it's great. Um, but I think, <laughs> I think that it's also, I think that it's, I think that it's also interesting to point out that in a patriarchy, the reason that women end up at the margins is because they're not considered part of the legend. Like, you know, you're talking about how illegible things get destroyed or forgotten about or end up kind of like, not mattering to the hierarchy. I think that that's because in the hierarchy that is a patriarchy, um, women don't have like a, they're not necessarily as legible to that hierarchy. Like there aren't, there aren't characters in the hierarchy of the patriarchy. Like you, you aren't a peer, you aren't a player. Um, and so you do end up at this marginal role that does give you that perspective, but that's because the hierarchy doesn't recognize you as a character in the like. Exactly, exactly. So uh, if you flip the equation, you can see the evidence of that, right? 
like when women philosophers or sociologists or economists like you know Jane Jacobs or Hannah Arendt look at society at the large, they are able to sort of make it legible for everybody. But when society looks in at what are traditionally considered women's domains, it typically meets illegibility, like the home, for example, and the zone of like domesticity and how home economics gets managed and women's work. That's much more illegible. Um, I should sort of shill a project here. So one of the projects that the Yak Collective is doing right now is called the New Old Home, and Pamela Hobart is leading that, and it sort of gets into that. So we're going to be releasing a report in the next few weeks, but it's about um, sort of understanding how the home is getting transformed by the pandemic and how the structure of the home and the insides and how it works as a machine is getting transformed. And it's surprising sort of participating in the discussion, how hard it is to think about the transformation of the inside of a home as opposed to the transformation of the economy because the economy at large is, um, has a lot of legibility to it. There's like economic measures, you can look at the stock market, you can look at you know, how money is behaving. Whereas the inside of the home, it's like, all right, all the uh, parents with children at home who are like schooling their children and trying to work at the same time, they're like complaining on Twitter, but you can't really unpack what's going on and like form a good mental model of what's going on. So yeah, the home is illegible because women are marginalized and women from the margins can make society legible because they're marginalized. So that's our theory. Two-sided coin. Yeah, um, so speaking about I, legibility, we could talk about the legal system, um, <laughs> which is up next. Um, mm -hmm. Which I think, okay, so I think you can apply the lens of legibility to the legal system that to some extent, um, at least in the tradition of, let's say, like the Western tradition, um, to some extent, like there's, so I think the one class I've taken on legal stuff would be the business law class I took in undergrad. Um, and one thing that stuck with me from that class is this kind of like hierarchy of what ends up being um, legal versus not legal. Um, so like the whole concept, at least as it was presented, is that there's kind of this like spectrum of like, there's definitely things that like are ethical that you should do or shouldn't do. Um, and kind of like a moral understanding underneath that. And um, at some point, a decision needs to be made about whether or not as a society we want to allow this thing and at that point a law gets made um but whether or not there exists a law about it doesn't necessarily say anything about the ethicality of the thing it just says what the repercussions of engaging in that like activity are if that makes sense um so the law the legal system is legible it makes so the, the legal system is the legible like consequences of actions so it's like the written and kind of codified like decisions that we've made as a society about how we're going to treat certain legal well moral and ethical quandaries and actually have made a decision about but underneath that there's an entire semi-legible um mm -hmm. kind of moral system and ethical system about how we as humans should like behave and interact that doesn't necessarily reach that level of legibility that is like a law has been written about it. I think that's uh, exactly right. And um, in the West, I think there's a spectrum between kind of like the Austrian higher kind of like um, tradition of um, legal systems on one extreme, which is all about like, you know, almost paving the cow paths of this is sort of conventional practice in this area of how people traditionally deal with each other. Then somewhere in the middle, you have the English common law tradition and probably on the most formalized legible end of things, you've got uh, the US and France, which had tend to have like, I think more um, formal top down, slightly more designed versions of legal systems compared to like parts of continental Europe or English common law. And uh, if I try to extend your scheme to the East, Islamic law was uh, pretty sort of uh, codified top down. So it has less of that legible subculture because Islamic law was interesting because Islam started out in the Arabian Peninsula, but then spread across like 10 other cultures that were very, very different. So it ended up being top down partly as a result of like a colonizing uh, aspect to how it spread. Um, and I think Indian and Chinese legal traditions tend to be a lot less legible because they've kind of had like uh, 
continuity from older religious systems of laws that kind of eventually had a Western secular system of law bolted on top. So it's a mess basically. Um, yeah, so I think legibility is an interesting lens to apply on legal systems. And uh, I, this by the way, I think is why the crypto world's uh, code is law thing. There's some serious problems with that because code is not law. Code is sort of a legible map of some unarticulated understanding of law. Uh, so this uh, is like, so I think like, okay, so I think this whole like law not being code actually depends on who you talk to because, and I haven't actually ever heard anyone outside of Silicon Valley espouse this, but one of like my first conversations I had, I was, yeah, was it, I can't remember when this was, at what point in my move to San Francisco from New York City, this interaction happened, but it was very early in my like moving to the Valley experience. Um, I was talking to the startup founder that I was doing some work for, and he had this really interesting, we had this whole conversation where we talked about the legal system as like a body of code, like law, like as like software code and how there were bugs in the system. And so every referendum was a patch that we were attempting to apply to the system. And so I think that this like, this codification or understanding of the legal system as being a set of code, like program code, that gets run and applied and every update, every bill that gets passed is an update. And actually, if you go and if you read congressional bills, they are written like certain types of specification patches in the software mm -hmm. update process. Because, yeah. and like, so in the Jane Jacobs episode, we talked about the bill that got updated by Robert Moses, which then led to the introduction of the usage of eminent domain in New York City. Um, part of the way that he wrote that law was like had to do like it was an update we're going to update this thing using this thing pointed over here and it wasn't you don't spell out exactly what's happening you're like in section so this like portion update section 22 of code 34 with the following we're replacing this language with this language and so if you want to understand the whole picture of what's happening you have to put all the patches together which is a lot like how code works so i think that I think that the understanding of the mechanics of how code is written and then like comes into being and becomes a set of laws in a book is very similar to the way that code is written and deployed. Um, so that's actually interesting because what you're describing is a very sort of pragmatic metaphor of code as law, whereas what a lot of like um, crypto enthusiasts mean when they use the phrases, they literally are thinking code is um, law in the sense of this abstraction of a particular program or smart contract I have in my head. It's literally a self-enforcing code of law and they don't have all these ideas about like update processes and like eventual learning, like the system kind of like the, what you're describing is a process of you have an initial abstract conception of a solution to a problem it gets sort of compiled onto the computer. That's the real world. It runs into problems. You do updates, you sort of trial and error, you kind of figure it out. And I think the dangerous form of code is law tends to like almost skip over or misunderstand that process of learning that is uh, like long-term software deployment. Like uh, Jonathan Zittrain made a very good version of this argument where he actually made, um, so he made this in a very direct, uh, legal analogy uh, where he talks about how laws are written and then you know executed by the executive like take anti-smoking laws right so congress might pass a bill saying you're not allowed to smoke in bars and then eventually through like layers of executive authority an individual bar might put a post in no smoking sign and it's still up to the bartender to say yeah i'm going to overlook you this or you go out that kind of thing right so there's a huge amount of friction between the idea that smoking should be banned all the way down to individual acts of smoking getting banned, right? Now, if you compare this to, for example, uh, the provisioning of software to SaaS coupled appliance devices, all that friction gets collapsed down to seconds. Like that's why you can have like devices being bricked. Like you have a whole bunch of iPhones or driverless cars or TVs and somebody decides that, hey, this is a good feature. I'm gonna turn it on. I'm gonna deploy it to production and suddenly a million devices are bricked. So that friction is lost. And I think that kind of like uh, failure mode happens when people sort of 
uh, are not able to distinguish what you might call the map and the territory of uh, the law because the the law as you understand it in sort of a code book of like cleaned up codified um, rules is sort of a map of the real set of like slightly ambiguous and uh, sort of um, judgment driven principles that people apply in actually using the law right so that's the yeah. difference between the two so to me the law is something that's in the head of a very trained lawyer or judge who's been spending like 30 years in a particular legal system the stuff in their head is what i think of as the law whereas for a lot of people a law is okay all the rules that are in this list of rules in this book that's the law right so you don't want the textbook kind of law person you want the person who has a evolved intuition of a particular legal system yeah who is the judge that there was a judge in particular that i think really um exemplified what you're talking about about having this working kind of knowledge of how all the laws fit together and the reason for it um who adjudicated the um oracle versus google case a few years ago yes I can't remember his name but he was like written up and wired and and the like because he like actually took the time to learn how to program such that he would have kind of an understanding of the underlying um copyright issues of the case yep. in terms of like re-implementing an api and whether or not you can copyright an api mm -hmm. and that sort of thing um so. yeah i don't remember the name either but i remember following that case a little bit but yeah that's exactly right where if the right kind of legal mind thinks of the law is sort of a learning process for learning about new realities and like making up principles about them, then it sort of works with uh, legibility and illegibility the right way. If not, it's kind of authoritarian high modernist and that can actually be done. Um, uh, so I want to like throw out a couple of examples on the other end. So there's this principle in authoritarian systems where if you're a dictator and you want to create a system of laws to oppress your people, and actually the rational thing to do is to make your legal system so complex that basically it's illegible to everybody who's being governed by it. So just through the core, like everyday fact of living your life, you're probably in contravention of like a bunch of different laws. And that gives the state sort of a, def a default ability to basically pick up anybody off the street and find some charge to accuse them of, right? And this is how dictatorships work deliberately and even the American system I think is now complex enough that in principle it's not supposed to be that way but in practice yeah if you just walk out on the street you're probably violating some law or the other and a cop could probably bust you for that. Isn't so that's, that uh, yeah, yeah. I feel like that's like the experience that you hear from the black community in America a lot is that the yeah. laws get you know jaywalking broken taillight like like that sort of stuff isn't something that, well, I did get, I have actually been pulled over the cops for jaywalking once, but that was as a high school student next to my high school where the cops were hanging out across the street, just waiting to catch someone jaywalking. Like, Yeah, and jaywalking is at least a fairly legible law where most people are familiar with the term. They know that it's in principle illegal, but they think that most of the time they'll be let go and they don't bother to take it seriously. But if you're black, then it's probably something you're aware that you could be busted for. Yeah, uh, but, but there's, I think even it gets worse because there's lots of laws that you're probably not even aware exist, but cops who have a you know motive to bust you will know about it. I mean, right, like Texas, this is um, the one about carrying wire cutters. Like it's oh, I didn't know this. Right, it's illegal to carry wire cutters in Texas because Texas used to have problems with like barbed wire, like ranchers would have barbed wire fences to keep cows out. And then, <laughs> I don't, guys either stealing cattle or running cattle across land they weren't supposed to be running them across would have wire cutters. They could cut the barbed wire that they came across. And so carrying wire cutters became illegal. And this is because of the way the Texas constitution works. It's like the constitution has been amended to make it illegal in the state of Texas to carry wire cutters and it's never been repealed. But. So tying this back to the Chesterton's fence analogy, this is quite literally <laughs> a law that says you don't know it, but you're not allowed to tear down the Chesterton's fence because the Texas ranchers cattle are behind it. Uh, a couple of other examples of this effect. Uh, so there's this uh, concept called work to rule. Have you heard of it? It's a labor um, thing, right? Where, uh, uh, yeah, 
you just work exactly according to the book and it turns out the system is actually not governable if everybody just follows the rules precisely. So that's a sort of non-criminal law example. And the third sort of thing I wanted to throw out there is the term Byzantine. It has come to mean like this complex mess of uh, governance laws that nobody can navigate. And that's, if you look at the history of the Byzantine empire, it was that kind of uh, empire. And the Ottomans kind of like inherited that and the Ottoman empire was also famous for that. It's like this hugely complicated Baroque system of like uh, rules and regulations. And if you're on the good side of the heap, our equation, it works for you. If you're under it, you, there's basically no way out. So. Yeah. So in Brazil, there's a, um, I'm not exactly sure how Byzantine the Brazilian legal system is, but my understanding is that like the state is quite corrupt and like politics. And one of the ways that this manifests itself is that it's, you have to like know the right person to get anything done. Um, so like, there's the there's actually like a term for the character that you go to to help you get things done in the system that is Brazil and I can't the word that's coming to mind is like Jeitinho but like I don't think that's the that means like a little uh, I don't exactly remember what that means but um I can't remember the translation but um, yeah so like a like, fixer right really like so just like a fixer or a bagman in um, the American yeah, yeah it's like is the idea. Yeah, and uh, yeah, India is similar. Like another like creaky old developing country that has like uh, a 200 year old British code of law bolted on top of like uh, several thousand years of like Hindu and Muslim religious law. And it's a huge mess. And typically, yes, it can oppress you. You don't know what laws you're breaking. And typically to actually navigate the system if you're not powerful in it, you need a, like somebody you know, a fixer or a bagman type person who can navigate for you. Because think about it, like a truly illegible legal system is one where not only is it corrupt and you have to bribe people to get anything done, but it's so illegible that if you don't have a middleman type person working on your behalf, you don't even know who to bribe and by how much in order to get anything through the system. And that's... I've experienced that. Like I grew up in uh, what was then the state of Bihar, which was then known as the most corrupt state in India. And I could not get a driver's license because they had stopped uh, administering the driver's license tests. And the only way to get the driver's license was to pay off a um, bunch of officials and bribe them and you would get it through the back door. And actually figuring out who had to be paid off to get a license, that was something I had to go around and ask people for. So this sort of this is kind of a familiar experience if you've grown up in a developing country. <laughs> okay, so this is where okay, so there's two things about the United States that worries me that I think that this is where we're headed. Like, so I, a while ago, I read an article about um, like a woman who had basically made it her job to be the fixer for a welfare like a community of like poor people who wanted to get on welfare. She was the woman who could tell you how to fill out the forms and check the right boxes so that you're application to welfare would eventually get approved so she became the fixer and because there's a lot of like articles and stuff about how american welfare system is made such that 98 percent of the applications get denied the first time mm -hmm. um and so it becomes this really laborious process of like figuring out exactly what right box to check and what to say and what not to say so that you get your stuff and so in that environment someone who knows how to navigate the system is like a niche develops, right? Um, yeah. The other thing that I think, I think to some extent coronavirus is going to create sort of this, sort of a like a void or like a backlog and that like, so yesterday, a few days ago, I saw someone tweeting about the fact the California state DMV is shut down and as a result, they're not processing driver's licenses and it's not clear when they're going to be back up. Um, when they shut down, there was already a backlog and there's going mm -hmm. to be bigger back I think he said like his tweet said there was like a three month backlog and now they're not supposed to be open for another X number of months. So by the time they do open there will be probably close to a year's backlog and California is a state that you really can't survive in without a driver's license. Um like the DMV in California is always overrun and like takes yeah. forever to go through. Like I have I I spent a lot of time at the DMV in California for reasons and it just took it took a long time the dmv in california was miserable the dmv in new york C city was amazing because not everyone drives in new york city like it's just yep. like not everyone needs a driver's license in new york city you can survive without a driver's license and so as a result the dmv did not feel 
and maybe it's just the system they have there but I, in my mind that was associated with like not everyone needs it therefore it's like a lot easier to navigate whereas texas dmv is also kind of terrible um i had to go get a texas driver's license and luckily luckily i got that done like three weeks before everything got shut down so i'm okay but like yeah yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to think back, which has been, I, I would definitely agree that California has been the worst uh, driver's license experience for us. Like, um, we got lucky. We got an appointment in San Bernardino County. Like, we had to drive an hour out of LA to get an appointment quickly. But it was the worst. And I would say Washington was okay, but New York State was um, very easy. But we were in upstate New York where there was no crowds. But I remember I, I had a Texas license for a year back in 2000, 2001. And that was probably the easiest. Like I had moved from Michigan to Texas for an internship. And it was like in and out, five minutes on a screen. It was the first time I'd taken one of the screen tests. Everywhere else was still paper back then. But yeah, Texas was good back then. At least Austin was. I don't know, you know what it is like now. But yeah, I think the driver's license is... Uh, is, is an interesting sort of litmus test of um, the legibility of a legal system because it's the single most common point of contact most people have with the legal system, right? So, yeah. Yes, and I had to have a Texas driver's license in order to get like some tax thing for the house that I live in. Like, so it's like tied, mm -hmm. like it, it is like it's tied to a lot of your status in the legal, it's your legibility in the legal system. Yeah, you're not, so you're I, not a person till you have a driver's license, exactly. Yeah, you're not a person of record, which is interesting. Um, so we've got two more things to talk about. Should we briefly maybe hop through at least the log level one? Uh, what was the other one? LARPing, right? LARPing, uh, yeah. yeah, let's skip the log level one and talk about LARPing instead. That sounds like more fun. We'll get to log level another time. Oh, you're right, talking LARPing. about LARPing. LARPing? Yeah, let's talk about LARPing, yeah. So what's your take on LARPing? So I think, okay, so LARPing means live action role play, right? Um, I think, so I, like, like we said in the intro, I've never actually been to a LARP, which I believe is like you find a character you would like to present yourself as. You spend a lot of time, energy, and effort building a costume such that you look as high fidelity as this character as possible. And then you go to a convention or an event where everyone who is attending is also representing themselves as a character of their choosing. Um, yeah. It's a lot like a Halloween in the States in America, where you pick a character that you want to represent yourself as and then dress up as that and go. Um, except that I feel like char Halloween characters that you, like the difference between like a LARP and a Halloween costume is that in the Halloween costume, um, I feel like the LARP, like you're actually assuming like a role and a character and the costume that you're putting on has like a backstory and a history and like there's an entire yeah, like yeah. narrative around that character. And that's I think it's, um, I think the distinction becomes useful when you think about the overall simulation that's happening. Like if you look at a Civil War reenactment uh, or a Renaissance fair, they're I think two of the biggest classes of LARPs in the US, right? Uh, whereas in Halloween, you've got a bunch of kids in costumes running around looking for candy. And the gestalt, the overall thing that's emerging from all these kids running around, there's nothing there. It's just a bunch of kids running around looking for candy. Whereas Civil War reenactment or a Renaissance fair, there is a larger sort of theater unfolding, especially Civil War reenactment, it's explicit. They're like replaying a particular battle that took place or something. So it's like role-playing an actual historical story and a Renaissance fair. So I, I should amend what I said earlier. I have been to one LARP, though not dressed up as a participant. It was a Renaissance fair. So this was actually even back in grad school. It was one of the first things, um, I think it might've been in the first couple of years in the US and a bunch of friends took me there and it was hilarious because I've never seen anything like that um, in India. Because in India, when you see something like something like a Renaissance fair, it's up on a stage as part of like a theatrical performance and you're in the audience far away, right? And here it's a, a Renaissance fair is once you get past the gate, it's like you're wandering in a kind of Disneyland theme park style thing where there's a lot of people who are not breaking character at all. They're like speaking in, I don't know, medieval English or something. Uh, I guess uh, the other difference, so there's the difference of there's an emergent level to the simulation in the LARP, but the other is 
it's not formally organized by um, a third external party. So I would not call Disneyland a LARP, like because Disneyland and its uh, theme park employees, they're paid by the Disney Corporation to play the roles. And the focus of, on the people who are actually visiting the park, they're not in character or playing a role. They're enjoying the rides or whatever. Whereas a proper LARP, I think the participants are creating sort of the simulation for themselves. It's not employees of the corporation. Right. right. Yeah, I think that's an important distinction. Um, so I think you can take, so I think there's definitely like these like structured and like, um, I always call them like very legible LARPs because it's like clear when you go to a Renaissance festival that there are people in costume and who are speaking foreign language, like for medieval English and they're like characters and they are embodying them. And so like there's like a narrative, like a, a general delusion or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it, that like everyone at that fair has like this idea of this like concept of what that old England that they're represent re-representing for you through this like process um, yeah. represents. Um, I think you can do sort of interesting things though in applying like LARP to like certain aspects of like real life. Um, and the one that I think is interesting to kind of apply it to is this concept of like imposter syndrome. Um, that like this is pretty familiar or like a thing that like, came up, especially early in my own tech career with like myself. I don't think I ever copped to feeling imposter syndrome, but I definitely felt it. Um, yeah, definitely felt it. But we <laughs> talk about whether that was justified or not. Because in my mind, I'm like, well, I was definitely an imposter, so that was a, a legitimate feeling to be feeling. But I've got like other friends that have also have the same feeling in the in in tech um but like at some point one aspect of imposter syndrome is this feeling that you're playing a character that like mm -hmm. if someone came along and like asked you the right question like your medieval english they would like catch out your medieval english accent for not actually being a real medieval english accent ah, yeah. and so like there's this fear that like I am, I am playing a game and putting on like a face and facade and it is important that I, that I continue to present that to the world because the consequences of feeling to reproduce the like fantasy of myself as XYZ technology as this character in other people's minds has like serious consequences for my ability to continue earning money. Um, so I think that's... that's uh... Uh, what, what you're saying suggests to me that there's an interesting spectrum of um, LARPing. So on one extreme of LARPs, there's uh, the kind of LARP where there's a very clear distinction made between reality and the role. And there's sort of a legible relationship between the two, right? I'm a real person. I'm putting on a costume and I'm very legibly becoming, becoming part of the simulation that's uh, separate from reality, right? And somewhere in the middle is something like an imposter syndrome where maybe people who've been in the field for like 30 years and are at the top and are the CEOs of the major companies, they're like, I am the man, I am the system. So I can't possibly be an imposter or something. So there might be a minority like that, but everybody else is on some spectrum of feeling fake. And on the other extreme, you have things where like uh, there is no such thing as real life. And uh, like, it's the whole postmodern Baudrillard uh, simulation and simulacra kind of uh, way of thinking about it. Like, uh, the concept uh, I've been writing about in the last few years, the idea of being premium mediocre. That's sort of a, a LARP in a very basic sense, except that there is no reality underneath. Like if you're living the lifestyle of a gentrified yuppie in like a you know, gentrifying part of a big city, you're eating particular at particular restaurants, you're wearing certain clothes, there's a whole sort of quality of it's a simulation of something for the benefit of you and everybody else immersed in it, but there's no there there beneath it. It's like simulations all the way down, right? So in that sense, uh, so that's a kind of LARPing where there is uh, no reality underneath and all the way to the other end where uh, there is, um, you know, Renaissance fairs kind of LARPing. All right, so we've processed LARPs. So, Venkat, do you think you have like a a role that you LARP currently, like professionally? I don't think I do, but I do think I do a lot of uh, code switching. So, code switch. Uh, you're familiar with the concept of code switching, right? Uh, so, uh, the sort of uh, simple form everybody's familiar with is 
um, you might switch accents when you're speaking the same language uh, in two different cultures. So, uh, and that's both practical and partly sort of um, social fitting in. So when I speak English in India, my accent changes slightly. In America, it changes slightly. But there's a deeper level of code switching between worlds you might inhabit, right? Like I have two aspects to my life, which is uh, consulting with clients, which is a very invisible private kind of activity where um, most people have no idea what I'm, I do, except to the extent I write about it. And then there is sort of the social media uh, blogger personality, which is much more visible. And the two are kind of like two different personalities, but sometimes you do get a chance to like have them collide. Like lately this um, Yak Collective thing I've been doing since it's an attempt to be sort of an open public network of independent consultants. One part of it, we use a Discord server. So part of it is social media presentation. So I'm on this Discord server and I find very interestingly that it's, it's causing sort of a collision of code spaces, so to speak. So it's like, you know, not namespace collision, but code space collision, as in I'm bringing some of my like consulting world behaviors and ways of thinking and practicing into something more like my Twitter persona. And it, it does cause this like schizophrenic um, reaction in my head. It's like, for example, on, uh, I'll try to think of a simple example. So on Twitter, I think I'm a pretty laid back, uh, relatively friendly person who is not very you know, abrasive or aggressive. Whereas in sort of business and sort of consulting environment, I can sometimes get pretty aggressive and abrasive depending on like the problems we're talking about. So it's a much more hard driving environment and you kind of have to be that way. If you're working in the business environment and you want to be that way. And one of the interesting things is the sort of more, I don't know, domineering abrasive personality side of me is coming through more on the social media side of uh, the consulting network. But on the other hand, it's going the other way as well. Like sometimes when I'm doing consulting work, and things that I see in social media become relevant, I kind of, that sort of infects my sort of business persona or something. So I wouldn't say I LARP anything, but yeah, I have code spaces and code switching between them. And the sort of worlds are colliding effects kind of things happening between them. But uh, yeah, that, that's, um, but on the other hand, imposter syndrome is sort of uh, an unfamiliar feeling for me because typically I, I think we talked about this at one point, like, if I feel like an imposter, I just don't stay. I just, I only go where I'm comfortable in my own skin. So I tend to have that bias towards exiting from situations where if I feel like an imposter, I'm out. Yeah, we talked about that. That's interesting. <laughs> I think I have a tendency to stick around places where I feel like an imposter um, because I think that's just where I, my brain likes. I just get so curious about what it is about that community or role that like I don't understand and so like I have to like stick around long enough to figure out what is the thing that I don't get uh-huh yeah it's it's a good sort of sign of like if you're feeling uncomfortable in your own skin and a bit of imposter syndrome it's a very good sign that there's learning to be had there and if you stick around you might learn something right so but, but it's neither necessary not, nor sufficient, as in there's other ways you could be learning. So it's not like you have to be feeling like an imposter when you're learning and it's not sufficient. Just because you feel an imposter syndrome doesn't mean there's something to learn there. It could be something totally different. Like we talked about like in you know, women in male dominated spaces, there's going to be an element of like being out of place that has nothing to do with your competence or ability to actually epistemically navigate that environment. It's just that you stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, so it's it, it, that kind of thing is also there. Yeah, and that's interesting though to think about because I was like thinking back recently. I've been doing a lot of kind of just one thing about moving back to where you grew up after being gone for such a long time. And I think part of this is also just my personality. The way that I moved away involved a lot of like kind of like forgetting and cutting off ties to like previous phases, so to speak. So moving back home has been an opportunity to kind of rewalk a lot of pre anything Lisa personality because I'm just in the environment where a lot of things I had forgotten about I have the opportunity to think about and one thing that I've kind of been rethinking through lately is like my school education um and like some of the memories I have are definitely this feeling of being isolated and like not connected to my peer groups like 
ever since I was like very young. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if like that feeling of like, at least for me, like the feeling of like not fitting in and like being kind of an imposter is like very deep rooted. Like it's, I wouldn't call it a comfortable place. It's not a fun place to hang out, but it's definitely like not something weird for me as an experience. So I like, I wonder if like, ending up in those spaces and having that be like professionally and it like epistemically like the things that I ended up spending time pursuing in like college for example were all the communities where I didn't feel necessarily very welcome or like adept at had to do with this like natural kind of just like that's just sort of where I tended to end up in childhood also. So, so how long were you away from Texas? Like between going to New York and sorry, California and stuff, how long were you away? Eight years. Eight years. Uh, but there was a difference, right? Like before the imposter syndrome would have been uh, more like basic learning as a younger person. Like everybody feels a little out of place as a teenager, no matter where they are. So that's not, not it's not being like back then you were not a fake Texan, you were a fake adult. But now that you're back from your wanderings around the world, you're a little bit of a fake Texan, like oh, <laughs> relative oh. to people who didn't leave Texas, right? Oh, and that actually, that was like kind of a hard thing about being back in Texas. And like, so the, these experiences I'm talking about, though, predate high school. These are like elementary school oh, okay. experiences that I'm talking about. Oh, so, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like it was, yeah, weird. Anyways, yes. Um, but like the, coming back to Texas, actually, I'd get in cabs and start talking to the driver, you know, like Lyft, whatever, get in the Lyft, talk to the driver. Cause I didn't have a car until like a few months ago. Um, and they're like, where are you from? And I'm like, ah, I'm <laughs> to answer your question. Cause I know what you're trying to ask me, but I don't think you're going to like the answer when I'm like, I'm from Houston. And they're like, yeah, I know you're not. <laughs> like, like where are you from? I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't, I can't answer that in a way that will well, you, You've definitely, like, I'm not good with accents, but you've definitely lost all traces of a typical Texan accent, right? Yeah. So your accent is now what, generic American? Or like somewhere between New York and California? I don't know. My voice is... <laughs> I have no idea. I think like, I think my talking voice changed a lot when I learned Portuguese also. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that makes... Uh, that's something I've thought about. Like uh, I have Indian friends who code switch a lot more dramatically. Like I have basically now a same sort of middle uh, accent, but partly because I'm, I can't actually do the full American accent, uh, but it's like, uh, <laughs> other than a few words, I don't actually switch very strongly between Indian English and American English. So I'm somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. You do have a Indian accent ish. Yeah, but it's not, it's somewhere like halfway between um, an educated in English Indian person living in India versus somebody who's like fully picked up on the American accent. Like I can't actually do many of the sounds Americans can, but I, I, when I speak this way in India, uh, people will immediately pick me out as um, somebody who doesn't live there anymore. Uh, other ways as well, like dress and stuff. But if I want to actually pass for local middle-class Indian English speaking person in India, I have to very, very consciously like reprogram how I talk like it ends up being faster some of the sort of uh, uh, tone modulations are very different I, I end up sounding a little bit more like uh, Apu on the Simpsons so uh, that's a whole other um, <laughs> story we can talk about sometime uh, but um, yeah it's, it's kind of interesting um, th there's the language aspect but there's other things too like I haven't spent significant time back in India other than for like visits to family for like a couple of weeks at a time. So I haven't had your experience of truly going back for an extended period. Uh, but it, I get a taste of that when um, I occasionally talk to people who used to know me very well in high school, but basically we haven't kept up since. So um, one of these is a friend of mine. I used to play ping pong with him like every day for two years in high school. So 11th and 12th grade, so 91, 92. And he's now a neurologist working in the UK. And he recently wanted to pick my brains about something. So he said, can we call? Like we hadn't talked in like 10 years before that. And before that, like for another 15 years or something, I don't know. Uh, but we talked and it was like really surreal because his mental model of me is still the way I was in 1992. So 
he was using a nickname I had back then. And he's like, it was clear that he was talking to 1993 version of me. And same thing with me. Like I had the same experience. Like we were talking across a time warp to each other. Okay. Hey, Venkat, I think I need to run. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So we're done for today. All right. Nice talking to you, Lisa. It's been great. I'll talk to you later. Bye, Venkat. Bye. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.